but very good responses. I mean, Mendham, I'd like to do him justice, but I'm very busy right now, but I guess I'll just sort of keep in touch through a cursory sort of response. Um, now, Mendham uses the metaphor of, say, what we would colloquially call a primitive human being without warning teleported from I don't know, the caveman stage of you know, Neolithic Europe or whatever that age is when the human beings first emerged and just plop him down in the middle of Piccadilly Circus or Times Square, you know, the center of Paris or something like that, just the epitome of modern urban complication. Um, what would the effect be? And, you know, I, I can relate to that. I can suddenly you sort of see your, your your blinkers are taken off and you see something utterly alien. For a long time, the caveman has been sort of never had to face this sort of reality because it is in its own in in a certain sense it is real. This city, this edifice of civilization, is real in that it's a real thing that has to be confronted. It's a brute fact that he's there, standing there in Times Square, looking at the chaos, and he has no clue what he's doing. And you know, we get you know the fire hose in the face, right? Um, <clears throat> the chaos of stepping directly into the moment of becoming without any preparation, without any uh, acclimatization, without any attempt to avoid getting the bends, as it were. Um, or any ability to do it. Insanity, I guess. And again, you reach for Zopfi's four coping mechanisms, anchoring and sublimation, distraction, etc. Um, now, I think I understand how said caveman would be dealing with this. It would simply be too much for him because it it's real, and in a sense, though, it's not real as well. Um, the modern Western human being looks at the city and sees a highly complex and interconnected web of relationships. You look at an office tower, and you you know the quote unquote civilized human being sort of goes, okay, there's people in there doing things that are important to them. They're exchanging information, creating value as we have defined it, i.e., money. And this enables them to make their own lives more, as individuals, more comfortable or whatever. They're up there, they're doing things for a reason. Whereas to a caveman, you sort of, you would think he would just look at it all and go, what is this? He doesn't, he has no means of understanding why anybody is in the buildings doing what they're doing, why these people are rushing everywhere, what they're doing. Um, he doesn't have a concept of, you know, um, Avenue of the Americas or Fifth Avenue or or uh, what an avenue is. He doesn't know what a bank is. He doesn't know what uh, telecommunications are. He doesn't know what any of this stuff is. So to him, it's kind of not real. All he sees is a bunch of human beings in weird shaped structures rushing around all over the place or sitting still, intently absorbed in things that he doesn't understand. It might even be somebody just reading a newspaper or staring at his mobile device, or it could be somebody sitting at a computer terminal or a cash register or at a desk or something like this. He just looks at these people, and he has no point of reference to see what these people are doing. To somebody who is used to seeing it, it makes sense. I know why a bank teller is standing in front of a computer with a human being there and why he's doing all these things and exchanging these bits of paper or just exchanging bits of nothing because it's all done electronically. It's just pushing buttons, somebody comes up, there's information or a conversation takes place, one person taps on the screen, thank you, and he's accomplished something and he left. That makes sense to me. He has accomplished something and the guy left. So he got what he wanted there, but I, as me, the proverbial caveman, I don't know any of this. All I see is a guy walking up to a, to a something I don't understand. I don't know what a counter is. I don't know what a computer screen is. I don't know what waiting your turn in line even is because I've never seen anything like that. I don't know why the guy has a, something called a necktie hanging from his neck. I don't understand why his hair is cut a certain way. I don't know why the 
the ergonomics of the room. I don't even understand why it's in the ground floor of a, of a la large tower like a lot of urban banks are, because I don't grasp what a, a skyscraper is, and I don't understand what a bank is, and I don't understand what a street is, and I don't understand what a sidewalk is, and all this kind of thing. I have no knowledge of any of the props. So it's chaos. It's the, higher, it's the fire hose in the face. I'm not used to it. Um, that's Zapfi's caveman. Now, look at the same urban milieu from the two points of view. Look at it from my perspective. I go into that sort of weird chaos that the caveman sees every day. I work in a large office tower in a building where people sit at computers all day. And when I step outside, I see people rushing everywhere, people selling things, people buying things, people talking on their cell phones, people hailing taxis, and, you know, the usual urban stuff. Um, I understand it all. It doesn't throw me for a loop every time I see it. I get it. He doesn't. We're both looking at the same thing. We're drawing completely different conclusions. He's driven crazy by the sight of all this. I'm not. Why? Well, because I've prepared myself to look into that chaos. Um, or I have been prepared to do it. But, again, we're looking at the same thing. We're drawing different conclusions. But what I'm seeing isn't any more real than what the caveman sees, or any less real. Because, phenomenally speaking, there's no such thing as Fifth, Ave Fifth Avenue. It's just a bunch of asphalt, which has been laid down, and somebody said, this is Fifth Avenue. It means something. But it, it doesn't mean anything to... Absolutely. I have to be explained what it means. Fifth Avenue, New York, now sort of has all kinds of associations to it. Avenue of the Americas has all kinds of associations. Times Square means something. It resonates with us. Um, but that doesn't make it real. That just means that there's been a mythology built up around these things that you can become accustomed to and use to your own benefit. I can go, like, say, if somebody said, Hey, Andy, you're going to New York City for the weekend, and here's thousand bucks spending money, have fun. I, I would think that was a wonderful thing, because I would know how to navigate New York City. I'd be somewhat at sea, because I'm not a native New Yorker, but I understand the North American urban thing, so I, you know, I wouldn't be completely lost. In fact, I would probably have a wonderful time of it, because I know how to navigate it. The quote-unquote caveman doesn't, but we're looking at the same thing. But again, it doesn't make my view of New York City any less valid than his. He looks at it and sees insane chaos, I see order and at least some order, or at least I see more order than he does. But it's we're looking at the same thing. It just depends on how our minds are. It's a, it's a question of preparation of perception. If I know what's coming, I'm better prepared to deal with it. You know, it's the usual thing about clairvoyance. Let's say, you know, I was a Polish guy in 1938, and I could gaze into a crystal ball and see, oh yeah, I... You know, the Germans are coming. I'd better get out of the way or make, you know, make my preparations to escape. A lot of people did this. Let's say, you know, you're, you're Jewish as well. You know that disaster is coming. Some people foresaw it. They left or they went to Earth or they prepared some sort of plan for the, uh, for the coming catastrophe. Other people couldn't see this, so they got swept up in it and wiped out. For, forewarned is forearmed. Yes, I get it. But that doesn't mean that I've really learned anything about the ultimate nature of reality. Um, just because I've learned, say, to survive Auschwitz, and I've learned the necessary tools, that's all I've learned. I've learned to navigate a minefield. I haven't learned anything fundamental about existence. Um, and at the end of the day, um, I'm really no better off for having... Uh, learned all of this than I was before I learned it. In other words, harm prevention, me, preventing me from getting swept up by the Shoah is, you know, it's just better than getting swept up, but it's not actually a benefit. I've just prevented a harm. It doesn't really result in any net benefit to me. So we've gotten into this screwy idea that survival in and of itself is a benefit. I don't see it that way. I, I, I don't subscribe to the will to life as the be-all and end-all of everything, at least. I think that we do may have the will to life, but I don't think it's decisive. We know that we're going to die. We know that there's no way to cheat the reaper, and yet we continue to live. Why is it some people are able to do this? Well, possibly they're ignorant and they don't think about it, the herd. 
others can look directly into the face of becoming and not be destroyed the same way that the some homo sapiens sapiens can navigate Times Square with a reasonable de degree of comfort while others would be thrown into a state of near madness by it. Um, coping is not flourishing. We need to cope in order to survive, yes, but survival is not an end in itself, again, as far as I'm concerned. I don't see it as a game where there's, you know, the only rewards are meaningless. I don't see it as teleological. I don't think that we're going anywhere. I don't think that the... I see everything as a wheel as opposed to a continuum. Again, does this make further discussion impossible? No, I don't think that it does, but it might make debate difficult because everything that I'm saying doesn't necessarily challenge anything that Inmendum is saying. In fact, we're in agreement in many of the key points here. It's just the conclusions that are reached that I think are different. and. It's not to say that the, that one conclusion is wrong. It's the the. I came at this entire thing interestingly through the the a different angle. I, I sort of early on I encountered the difference between say Jainism and Tantra. Now there is such a thing as Tantric Jainism, believe it or not, but we'll leave that aside. But the absolute life. I, I shouldn't say negating, but the idea that through great efforts we can fundamentally alter the nature of the wheel of existence, if you want to call it that, the nature of reality. We can fundamentally alter that. Uh, that's what the Jains say, and even Jainism is the religion or the faith or the belief or the philosophy of the conquerors. The Jina are the Jinas are the conquerors, and the Jinas are whom the Jains revere. They have overcome something, something vast and gigantic. They have actually say, in a sense, they have the capacity to stop the wheel of existence. Um, whereas a tantro, tantric would say, impossible, you can't do that. It's, you know, okay, go ahead and try. Go ahead. See how far you get. See what happens when you try to do that. Um, when you actually try to improve this, this existence. When you actually try to not just prevent bad things from happening, but actually make this existence the, in, in its exteriors, a good place. You can't do it. Now, again, I'm not going to come down on that. I'm not going to make a. I'm not going to sit there and tell the Jane that he's wrong or anything like that. Again, and Mendham is kind of, you know, saying the same thing as I am in that way. There's really no way to have a conversation between those two. Um, but I don't think that that means that that one or the other is necessarily right or wrong. Um, I think that it's just a, a, a certain take on the underlying presumptions, the underlying assumptions in inherent in each one. Um, it's it's two different takes on certain futilities. The futility of attempting to improve the universe. Benatar sort of implies a certain degree of futility, saying that you can't really improve anything. Ergo, um, since we can't improve the exteriors, we have to stop in creating interiors. Um, okay, and again, I would sort of respond with leaving apart the whole argument of whether or not consciousness is an emergent property of the physical universe, which is a massive argument in and of itself. Let's leave that apart. I could say that, yes, I get it, that everything exterior can be shown to be futile and devoid of the good, but that's not where you're going to find the good. You're only going to find the good on the interior, because that's where the good gets placed on things, or the bad. Uh, it's, on, it's in the interior, it's in the experience of things. It's at the experiential level that you're going to find um, good and bad, not in the exterior. Um, Benatar places, or any kind of life, quote-unquote, life-denying, and again, I don't, I understand the objection to that. I don't mean it as an accurate term, but I'm just trying to talk about two polarities here. A life-denier would say, no, no, you, you can actually make a difference in the exterior, ultimately. At the end of the game, you can. And okay, what do you do then? If like, how do you reconcile that? Somebody would say that 
no, that's not where benefit resides in the exterior, it resides in the interior. How are you going to... How are you going to sort of reconcile those two to the point where they can have an actual discussion? Um, I don't know. It might be tough. I suppose as this discussion kind of develops, um, if it develops, we'll have sort of we'll, we'll be able to refine this because I, I do see this as a discussion that's kind of refining itself in as much as the momentum manages to keep itself going. Uh, but um, it's quite a challenge, isn't it? Uh, to actually be able to actually discuss this in, in a coherent way without it, it and, and it's even a profoundly irritating discussion because you sort of say okay let's assume this and then the other party says no I'm not going to assume that oh okay I'll back up a bit and then we'll assume this and then the other party says no I'm not going to assume this so okay then you have to back up and back up and back up to the point where you you've kind of everybody is backed up to try and find some sort of common ground which may not in the end be there. Um, if you have a sort of view of things that opposites kind of complement each other, that's not really necessarily a problem. How do you solve the problem of somebody looking at the world with a completely jaded view of it and somebody else looking at it and saying, wow, am I ever glad I'm here? Um, you know, how do you do that? Uh, how do you how do you get these two to sort of have some way of even communicating with each other? I don't. I'm not saying that's impossible. It's very difficult, and nothing demonstrates this better than this discussion. Again, I'm kind of busy. I'll try to respond more effectively uh, as time permits.